raise up somebody to minister to you, really minister in music. Not all music ministers. Some of it makes me mad, even in church. But I've, I've preached many years. And there was a brother, Lance Carpenter. I don't know if anybody here knows Brother Lance or not. I knew that. I didn't never met you, but I seen Lance in that tailor. And uh, Lance and I would run many meetings together. I'd preach and he'd sing. Sometimes he'd sing and I wouldn't have to preach. And uh, Brother Lance now is down in Florida and he's got Alzheimer's and uh, got heart trouble. He's not traveling much. And I've been praying, I've been praying that somebody would take Brother Lance's place. You could just be healed. Very well could be. God gave Brother Lance the ability to lead a congregation to real worship. I sensed a little of that in that singing tonight. I remember we was over in Franklin, North Carolina, and I'll get done here in a moment and preach, but that just brought back so many memories. And uh, was pre I was preaching at Emmanuel Baptist Church, and Brother Lance was doing the singing. We're staying at a little motel that sat catty-cornered. I never saw one, but it was catty-cornered, and he was in the room next to me, and, and uh, Brother Lance, very, very gracious gentleman, about six o'clock of the morning, knocked on my door. Well, I didn't think he was much of a gentleman for doing that at six. But he I opened the door and he's standing there in his PJs with his guitar around his neck. And he stepped in the room and he said, Brother Eddie, said, uh, let me sing this to you and see if you think it'll work. And he sang that, I have not forgotten, God's only begotten. <laughs> I said, I think that'll work. I said, I really think it will. And God's blessed that song all over America. And uh, I'm glad you sang tonight. I'm really glad you sang. I'm glad to get to meet you. I mean, I'm just not saying that. That's something in my heart. And uh, I, I appreciate that. Keep, keep using your talents for the Lord. Well, it's a joy to be here. I've enjoyed this week. I've, I really have enjoyed it. And I appreciate you coming tonight. Appreciate everyone that's here. Good to have some of our folk back. Brother Darrell and his family back. And Brother Joe, Miss Thelma, and then Brother Matthew Burgess and his wife Alyssa. As members of the church here tonight, uh, Brother Matthew's a preacher, and I, <clears throat> I don't say that lightly. Brother Matthew is a preacher, Amen. and uh, I certainly enjoy hearing him preach. <clears throat> God's blessed him, and uh, if you ever, you pastors need anybody to fill in for you sometime, I recommend him. You can sure, he'll, he'll tell you the truth of the Word of God. And I appreciate it. I want us to open our Bibles tonight to Isaiah chapter 50. My throat's not in the best tonight. I'm feeling a little scratchiness. Is scratchiness a word? I'm feeling a little of that in my throat. And uh, normally when that begins, then I'll have a little difficulties with it. But uh, you pray for us that the Lord would help us. Thank you, church, for all that you've given monetarily. Thank you so much. Thank you for making this meeting possible. Continue to pray for us there at Liberty Baptist in Crossville. God's certainly helping us. 
and uh, pray that God would continue to work His will in His way there. I'm, I'm like a kid with a new toy. I'm excited to death about what God is doing for us, and I praise Him. Isaiah chapter 50, and I want you to notice as we read down through here, you'll find a mixture of afflictions. You say, preacher, what do you mean? Well, you'll see some of the afflictions of the Son of God, and then you'll see some afflictions of the saints of God. And what I love about that is that we find them both tied together in this very chapter. And that lets us know that He is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Notice, if you will, in verse number 6 of Isaiah chapter 50. We, we understand this text is a, a prophecy concerning uh, the uh, beating and the wounding of our Lord. He said, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my my face from shame and spitting. And all of that is referred to concerning the Lord in the New Testament. Verse 7, For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore shall I set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God will help me. I love that. It's there twice. Who is he that shall condemn me? Lo, They all shall wax old as a garment. The moth shall eat them up. Now notice verse 10, which is my text for tonight. We've seen the afflictions of the Son of God. Now he's going to deal with the saints of God. Look, verse 10. Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light. Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. (laughs) Notice what it says here, dealing with not the unsaved, but the saved. When he says, you that Feareth the Lord and that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light. That tells me that there are dark times, even after light has been revealed in us in salvation. That tells me that. There's the people of God, the saints of God, are going to encounter dark times, even after we're saved. I want to preach tonight on when children of light walk in darkness. Let's ask God to help us. Father, thank you for the privilege you've given us together tonight. Lord, you assigned us this word this afternoon. I pray, God, that you would touch and help us. You know the need of every heart tonight. I pray, God, that you would touch our voice and, and Lord, help it not to be repulsive to the listeners. And then, Lord, uh, help us and strengthen us tonight. I'm tired and weary in body, but I'm glad that Paul said that even though this outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And I do need a renewing, a refreshing in my heart and soul tonight. Thank you for these who have come together. And I pray now, Lord, that you would bless the word. 
And God, that hearts would be encouraged and strengthened, maybe enlightened and instructed tonight, and maybe one here that's unsaved, that you might bring them unto the acknowledgement of yourself. For whatever is accomplished tonight, you will get all of the glory for it. Thank you, Father, for the good singing tonight. How it's ministered to our hearts. Have your will in your way. And we'll praise you and thank you. For it's in your precious and wonderful name we pray. Amen. Now, as we move right into this, I want us to notice, first of all, at when I'm dealing here with when children of light walk in darkness, notice, first of all, the people at dress. He said in verse number 10, asking this question, Who is among you? Now, I understand what, what Isaiah is referring to, but I want to bring that question to us that's right in this auditorium tonight. Who is among you that feareth the Lord? I trust that everybody here tonight say, by the wonderful grace of God. Who is among you that feareth the Lord and that obeyeth the voice of his servant? And then he says, Who walketh in darkness and hath no light. We see here the people at dress. First of all, it's a saved people that he's talking to. Fearing the Lord. Who is among you? that feareth the Lord. I'm telling you, I'm glad tonight that there is a holy reverence in my heart concerning the God of heaven. It's not that I fear him as a taskmaster, but I reverence, reverently fear him as my father. Amen. And I don't want to bring a shame and reproach upon his name. Now I'm telling you, friend, I'm glad tonight for that holy fear and that reverential fear. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And also, Proverbs said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So it just tells me that if you don't fear the Lord, you're lacking in good sense. Amen. Because he said it's the beginning of wisdom and the beginning of knowledge. Hallelujah. So I want to say tonight that the, one, the people he's addressing, Brother Darrell, is saved people. Brother Mike, I'm glad tonight that I'm saved by the grace of God. I'm saved by the grace of God. So I see it's a saved people that he's addressing. But now notice another thing, attribute that he deals with concerning the people addressed. It's not only a saved people, but it's a submitted person. Now this is kind of narrowing it down. Now listen to me carefully. He said here, he said, who is among you that feareth the Lord? And then he says that obeyeth. Let me say to you, friend, how if you really fear the Lord in the right way, there will be an obedient heart and an obedient life unto Him. It's not only a person that's saved that can, and the, and the emphasis that I'm dealing with tonight will be in the latter part of this verse about staying on the Lord God and a name that you can learn to help you when you're walking in dark times. Hallelujah. Now I'm saying, friend, you got to understand that everybody can't claim the promise of this verse. It's a saved person, first of all. But then, of course, that narrows it way down when you think about the population of the world. 
but then it's a submitted person. And that narrows it down, way down, at when you t- think about the population of the Christian world. At there's not a lot of folks submitted, and that's why they don't know what to do when tragedy sets in. But hallelujah, I'm glad if you're saved and submitted, there's somewhat that you can learn from in the dark times, amen. So we see it's a saved person. It's a saved people. It's a submitted people. Not only that, but he says that obeyeth the voice of his servant. Now out of the saved people and submitted people, that narrows it on down to a settled people. What's a settled people? Well, they're settled in a particular place. The servant here that he's talking about is, of course, the Holy Ghost, always. I don't have time to deal with all of that, but it's the Holy Ghost of God. But the Holy Ghost of God uh, using the under-shepherd, the man of God, who is the servant of God, it's a saved people and a submitted people that settled in under a man of God. Hallelujah. Hey, that narrows it way on down. So I want to say it'd just probably be a handful, but oh, I'm telling you, it sure is a good thing when you're saved and you're submitted and you're settled when you head into some dark time. I'm glad God gives us a promise that he'll help us there, that he'll take care of us. So if you're saved, submitted, and settled, there's good news for you tonight. (laughs) And if you're not, I trust you will be before long because the Lord certainly is coming. So we see here's a group of people that serving under the man of God, not causing any rebellion, and uh, they're submitted and settled and saved in the house of the Lord. Okay, so we see the people addressed. Secondly, I see the problem acknowledged. Uh, Well, what's the problem, preacher? Well, here's a saved people. Here's a saved person, a submitted person, And a saddled person, somebody said, well, surely if somebody lived like that and their life was that clean, they wouldn't have any difficult times. But oh, let me say, and I'm coming to find this out, and I'm over 60 now, but I'm coming to find this out, that the closer you walk, and the closer you desire to be with God, a lot of times the more the world, the flesh, and the devil, and not only that, but God himself wants to bend us and and conform us to the image of his dear son. And when he's doing that, it's always contrary to what we desire. And I believe that God allows dark times to come in our life so that we'd appreciate the light. Hallelujah. Hey, I'm telling Telling you, there's the children of light. Sometimes walk in darkness. Difficult times. You know, a lot of these TV evangelists, and I have been evangelists on TV, but so I don't mean all of us, but just simply what I'm saying is they'll tell you that if, if you're living for God and everything's okay, that everything will be okay. But I want to tell you that's not so. The only thing wrong with that is not the truth. Some of the greatest Christians I've ever met in my life was folk that was invalid, but they had a heart for God. (laughs) Dark times, dark times. Brother Joe, I've I've been in hospitals before. And I'd go in there to try to be an encouragement to the patient. And before I left, I, I was the one that God wanted needed. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. You see, if you're, if, you're, if you're what you need to be for God, 
when the dark, difficult times come, there's someone there. And praise God, you can stay on him and learn his name and stay on him. What a great God. Uh, so I see here the problem acknowledged. The children of God sometimes enter into dark places. Uh, think about this with me. I see that would be times of dark paths. You really don't know which way to go or what to do. No light. Who walketh in dark? Who walketh in darkness? Who walketh in darkness? That's a dangerous thing to do. I can assure you this, to run in darkness is much more dangerous than to walk in darkness. And a lot of times that's what folk do. When the, when the darkness settles in, they panic. And they try to run. A lot of them run away from God. But in doing so in the darkness, when you run, you're going to do yourselves more damage than you ever thought about. I remember when I was just a little boy, we lived up in, up in the holler. You know what a holler is, don't you? It's a little valley between two yells. <laughs> and we lived up in the holler. And I, I must not have been more than six or seven years old, and my uncle, dad's brother, lived down as you come into the holler, and we lived back up in the holler, and mother was kneading some cornstarch. How I remember that, I don't know. But it was already dark. And uh, daddy said, son, you want to go uh, get that cornstarch? Yeah, I'll go, you know. And uh, so they left the light on down there. But now dad being dad, and you'd have to know daddy, you know, when I... I went and got the cornstarch. Boy, everybody's telling me what a big man I was, you know. And boy, you're something else. But I headed back up in that holler and daddy had cut the porch light out. And uh, it, was, it wasn't more than 500 yards, but I thought it was over 10,000 miles. Because I couldn't tell how far it was because it's dark and you don't know. Boys, I headed up through there. You know, darkness will cause you to see things that's not there. Listen carefully now. I saw huge, I saw huge alligators. Now, I'm, I'm telling you, they was they were seventy five foot snakes, as big around as a fifty five gallon barrel, going up that holler. And I started running. And when you run in the dark, you're going to mess yourself up. And I run out, uh, now let me just clarify myself, they wasn't no alligators or snakes, but I did see them. Some of you looking at me strange. I, I, I did see them. They, they were there for me. And, and by, the time, by the time I got back to the house, I'd fallen, no telling how many times, I was bleeding and bloody, hurting. I got back to the house and Mother Shore jumped on Daddy for cutting the light out. And I sure appreciated her for doing that. And, uh, but, what, but what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that he, if you're walking in darkness, just keep on carefully going forward. But don't try to run. Don't try to run. Don't try to get run out of it. Don't try to run into it further. Just walk steadily on with God. That's where he said in Psalm 23, 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And that's not talking about the death of physical life. That's talking about taking the sheep to a higher plane. Yea, though I walk 
Oh, through, hallelujah, you're going to come out on the other side. The valley don't last forever. The darkness won't last forever. You just walk on with God. And when the children of light walk in darkness, you just walk on with him. You say, but I don't know where he is. No, but he knows where you are. And I can tell you this, listen to me carefully. If you're, There's nobody ever ran with God. At, that you'll find those that walked with it. At, but nobody ever ran with him. Why is that? Because God's not in any hurry. And we just walk with him. You say, but I can't sense where he is. Doesn't matter. He knows where you are. You just stay on with God. God will bring you out. Hallelujah. There's the times of dark paths. Man, I've already, but anyway, here. Notice, let me just say a couple of words here in Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 3. You don't hear much preaching out of Lamentations. Matter of fact, I don't even like to read Lamentations. Now, I don't preach a lot out of Lamentations. Why, preacher? Because I just don't preach a lot out of Lamentations. It's where, Jeremiah, it's where Jeremiah is sitting in the ashes of his homeland when Nebuchadnezzar had came down and carried everybody away that was worth anything and left the people there that nobody wanted. I thought about this when, when our brother was singing that song about Jose and Gomer. <laughs> nobody, but, but, but they left the prophet Jeremiah there. Aren't you glad? Hey, aren't you glad that God's always got a preacher for everybody? <laughs> and so he took Daniel, you know, took him to Babylon, but left Jeremiah. And Jeremiah sitting in the ruins of his ashes, everything destroyed. And the book of Lamentations is written from an ash heap. And that's why I don't like to read it much. Some's entitled it a cloud burst of grief and a in a sea of sorrow and a river of tears. It's just, it's just a mess. I bet you don't spend a lot of time in it either. But you know what he said? He said in chapter 3, verse 1, I am the man that hath seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He hath led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. Now here is a servant of God. Here is a man that saved, submitted, and settled, entering into darkness where there is no light. This is Jeremiah. Jeremiah wouldn't have made it in the who's who's column in the religious organizations today. He never had one convert. No one ever believed anything he said except for one man. And that's that fellow that dug him up out of that pit. But he said in verse 3, Jeremiah's thinking this. He said, surely against me is he turned. He turneth his hand against me all the day. He said, God's turned on me. That's what you think in the dark times. He said, my flesh and my skin hath he made old. He hath broken my bones. He hath built it against me and compassed me with gall and travail. He hath set me in dark places as though that be uh, as they that be dead of old. He said, I'm in a dark place. But he just keeps on talking and he just keeps on talking. I mean, he just keeps on writing and he just keeps on complaining. And then the verse 21 says, uh, well, this I recall to my mind. All of a sudden, something dawns on him. Therefore, have a hope. <laughs> he, said, he said, what I remembered spring up hope in my heart. And the same thing he remembered, you need to remember when you're in the dark time. It'll, it'll produce hope. What was it? It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great 
is thy faithfulness. Hallelujah. You know what he remembered? He remembered the name of the Lord. He said, God still knows where I am. God knows where I'm at. And God knows where you are also. He said, the mercies are new every morning. I preached a little old message one time on morning mercies. Morning mercies. Why, preacher? He said, they're new every morning. I'm glad I don't have to live off of yesterday's leftovers. Even though my times are dark, he's got mercy for me this in the morning as he had this morning. You know why they're morning mercies? Because they come freely. <laughs> you know, the morning don't cost anybody anything. It just shows up. And so does the mercies of God. As sure as the mornings come, mercies is going to be there. That's right. They not only come freely, but they come freshly. There's never been a repeat of a morning. Mornings has been going on since creation, but there's never been a copy, a repeat. God never had to reach back there and get a morning back there and reuse it. No, every morning is fresh. Hallelujah. And I want to tell you that the mercies of God are just as fresh as the mornings are. Because they're morning mercies. They're new every morning. They come freely. They come freshly. And they come faithfully. There's never been a day without a morning. Hey, hey, hey. There's never been a dark night without a morning. Hallelujah. I'm glad they come faithfully every day. The mercies of God are available. And then let me say they're going to come forever. Why? Because the Bible said the mercies of God are from everlasting to everlasting and they'll never end. Why is that? Because we're going to a place where there'll never be a night. It's just going to be morning from now on and it'll be mercy, mercy, mercy. And we've got it available to us now. Especially if we're walking, if you're walking in dark. In the dark places. So it's a times, it's times of dark paths. In the dark times, it's times of dull perception. No light. No light. You think things in there. You start believing things in the dark that's not so. Your perception's not real clear and true in the dark. Then it's the time, it's times of the devil's presumption. When you're walking in a dark time, things are not going good. The devil will crawl up on your shoulder and scream in your ear. I told you so. I told you he didn't love you as much as he loves others. But could I tell you the devil is a liar and the father of it? The Word of God teaches us that there's going to be difficult times on our way to heaven. But what is so wonderful is our difficult times are coming to an end. Amen. Amen. <laughs> oh boy, I wish I felt like preaching tonight. I'm telling you, hey, I'm telling you, God, that hey, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to know that God will take care of His own. He'll take care of his own. So we see the people addressed, the problem acknowledged, but then last of all, the prescription that's advised. You go to the doctor with your problem and he gives you a prescription. You go down to the druggist hoping it'll work. Well, Isaiah diagnoses the problem and then gives the prescription. What's the prescription? Let him, let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. <laughs> That's just real good. Somebody said, That's too simple. Oh no. That it's the it's the most gracious thing you could do is stay on God. In the dark. But what does that mean? That word stay means to lean upon. And if you're walking in the dark, you better be leaning on him. Amen. Amen. No, I, I thought about this. First of all, he said, 
Let him, let him trust in the name of the Lord. If you're in a dark time, there's a name to learn. And then let me say to you, listen very carefully. You might ought to learn it before you enter a dark time. You might ought to get acquainted with him and be walking with him before darkness, before that difficult time settles in. Amen. He said, let him trust in the name of the Lord. I got to looking at some different names of God. And I won't deal with them, but Genesis 22. <laughs> oh, Ab Abraham's headed up the mountain with his son Isaac. Isaac, Lord willing, I'm going to preach from this Sunday morning on why Isaac wanted his daddy's God. That's daddy's day. And uh, we uh, and I come, we I see them as they're headed up the mountain, and I see them as they get up there, and I see them as Isaac allows Abraham to tie him, lays him on the altar, draws the knife back, getting ready to take the life of his own son, and the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, do thy son no harm, and. Uh, he said, uh, he said there, uh, and he said, For I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes, and, and he looked behind him and saw a ram caught in a thicket. Well, you said, Preacher, where are you going to with this? Well, Abraham, after he got done sacrificing that ram, on that same altar, he begins to pray. <laughs> and he built an altar, the Bible says in verse number 14, and Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. What does that mean, preacher? That means the Lord is my provider. See, Abraham's in a difficult time right here. But he stayed on the name of his God. He trusted in the name of the Lord. And the Lord provided for him. Amen. You know, Abraham and Isaac walking up this side of the mountain. They couldn't see the other side of the mountain. I'm glad God can see both sides of the mountain. And as Abraham and Isaac's walking up this side, unbeknowing, God's bumping a ram up on the other side. <laughs> Abraham and Isaac don't see it. <laughs> Abraham and Isaac stops and talks. The ram stops. You need to understand. You need to continue on with God. Amen. And they go up there, and as soon as Abraham raises that knife, God rams the ram in the thicket. And the ram's got two horns. Let me say, let me say here that that's not the prophecy fulfilled where Abraham said God would provide himself a lamb. That wasn't a lamb in the thicket. That was a ram in the thicket. He was looking at Calvary when he said God would provide himself a lamb. That was a ram in the thicket. There's a difference in a lamb and a ram. And a ram's got two horns. I like to think that that, 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 that little thorn bush had that ram caught by one by mercy and one by grace. <laughs> mercy and grace and the Lord Jesus, mercy and grace and his love for us held him to that old rugged cross. And they take that ram and that ram was sacrificed in the place of Isaac. God provided for Abraham. God will provide for you in your dark times if you'll just continue on with him. I think, think about Exodus 15. I find there in Exodus chapter 15, uh, they've, they've, been, they, they've come to Myra, and there's, uh, the waters are bitter, and the Lord tells Moses to cut down a stick and throw it into the waters, and the waters, the bitter waters were made sweet, and Bible said in verse 26, And the Lord's talking to Moses and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, 
and will give ear to his commandments and keep all of his statues. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. Now he says, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. That is Jehovah Rapha. You know what that means? The Lord is my healer. In your dark times of, of difficulties in your physical body, remember, trust in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Chapter number 17 of Exodus. You'll find there that they've just won a victory against Amalek. And the Bible says in verse 15, And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisa. Jehovah Nisa means the Lord is my banner. In other words, it's his flag that I'm fighting under. <laughs> In your dark time, remember his banner over you is love. Hallelujah. I see in Judges 6, he's talking to Gideon. Gideon builds an altar and calls it Jehovah Salom, which is the Lord is my peace. You go to Psalm 23, verse 1. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. That means Jehovah Reha. Means, you know what that means? The Lord is my shepherd. Then you go to Ezekiel 48, and there he's called Jehovah Shammah, where he says, "Is the Lord will abide forever. It's the Lord is my ever-present one, ever-present one. So the prescription advised is there is a name to trust or a name to learn. There's a nearness to live. He said, and let him stay upon his God. Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. Isn't that wonderful? Isaiah, Isaiah 26, 3 says, That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. Stayed. Who is this, they said in in Song of Solomon 8, 5. Who is this which cometh up out of the wilderness leaning upon her beloved? That same word leaning is the exact Hebrew word staying upon his God. Who is this that's coming up from the wilderness staying upon his beloved, leaning upon her beloved? Who is this? It's the church. <laughs> Amen. There's a, there's a nearness to live and there's a need to lean. Let me say, if you're in the dark times, and I didn't realize I was so physically depleted tonight till I got up here. I didn't realize that I'm tired. But I want you to, I want to ask you a question. Maybe your world has turned upside down. You don't know what to do. The devil's messing with your mind. He's telling you to run. God's telling you to stay. You're trying to figure it all out yourself. Trying to figure your way out of the darkness trying to understand why it all happened and you may not ever understand. You may not ever get the answers to your questions. He didn't say here he would answer your questions. He said if you're a child of God walking in darkness and you have no light, trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon your God. I think that's a pretty good prescription that he advised. Amen. Trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon your God. You don't know the way out of the darkness. 
Staying on him will get you out. Staying on him, trusting in him will get you out. He'll be your provider. He'll be your healer. He'll be your peace. He'll be your banner. He'll be your ever-present one. He'll be your shepherd. If you'll trust in the name of the Lord, and stay upon your God. Hallelujah. Amen. When children of light walk in darkness, I do know this. I've lived long enough to understand that if you've got a real desire in your soul to please God and to be what He wants you to be, God will start dealing in areas of individuals that you love the most. I've lived long enough to know that's the truth because he wants supreme love from us. And he'll start dealing in areas. Listen, when I, when I pastored previously, I thought that all of my problems and, and basically all of the problems that I faced came through the avenue of other, of other people. Church problems, dealing with people constantly, daily. Thousands of problems. But then God began to deal in areas in my immediate family. Somebody said, well, preachers, because you're no good. I'll agree I'm no good. But God pulling that supreme love to himself. And now God deals in the area of that which you love the most. And you'll start praying, God. See, back then I thought those were the worst trials I would ever have to face didn't think I'd be able to make it through. But for the last 15 years, I've prayed, God, I'll gladly go through those again a thousand times over if you just won't deal with my immediate family. But I've learned that the more you want to serve him and love him, the closer he begins to operate. Amen. And sometimes your dark times will be in areas of who and what you love the most. But just remember the hand of God is still with you and operable and working in you, with you, and for you. <laughs> so, trust in the name of the Lord and stay on God. Let's stand.